Ruben Uriarte is the state director for Northern California MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, as well as the deputy director for MUFON's international investigations. He's also a member of the Mars Society. We'll talk with Ruben about the search for life on Mars and, of course, about investigating UFO sightings. Maureen and I will also discuss a recent episode of Larry King's show where he talks about UFOs. That and other space and UFO news right now on Spacing Out. everyone and welcome to Spacing Out. I'm Jason McClellan. And I'm Maureen Ellsbury. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Later in the show we'll talk with Ruben Uriarte about UFOs and about the Mars Society. But first, let's talk about the news. <laughs> UFOs and other mysterious phenomena are popular topics on US television. With each new season of programming, it seems as though more and more networks are racing to meet the apparent demand for content exploring these intriguing topics. The Discovery Network Science Channel is a prime example of a network embracing shows exploring UFOs and extraterrestrial life. Although the channel has aired several shows addressing these topics, the Science Channel premiered a new show that probes these mysteries. Professor Weird is the title of the show that premiered on Saturday, August 18th. This weird professor is theoretical nuclear physicist Dr. Franklin Rule. According to Dr. Rule, his new show focuses on the scientific evidence for UFOs and ETs, paranormal phenomena, cryptozoological entities, weird crime, bizarre medicine, strange people, and anything else of unusual and fascinating nature. The Morgan Freeman hosted show Through the Wormhole on the Science Channel has repeatedly explored the topic of extraterrestrial life. The channel even devoted an entire month, the month of March of this year, to exploring the question, are we alone? So is there really a need to air yet another show dealing with these topics on the Science Channel? On his Huffington Post blog, Dr. Rule explains, I feel that the scientific community has been myopically narrow-minded concerning the feasibility of these various subjects. As a PhD in theoretical nuclear physics, I endeavor to bring the scientific perspective to these controversial topics from an open-minded stance. The basic description of the show provided by the Science Channel reads, Join Dr. Franklin Rule and his devoted assistant on their never-ending quest to obtain offbeat knowledge for their weekly internet hit, The Realm of Bizarre News. It is unclear at this point whether or not Professor Weird will be a series on the channel, but the pilot episode is what aired on Saturday, August 18th. And I didn't watch the show, and Maureen, I know you didn't either, but from what I've seen of this uh, Weird Professor's previous work, and the video he posted to announce this new show he's doing, I, I don't know. It's difficult to get a read on exactly how these topics are being presented, but to me it seems like it's being presented as something kind of, I don't know, weird. He is so weird. Okay, so, and also I'm a little confused because they're talking about how his Realm of the Bizarre little web series is like wildly popular. But when I searched it, I found all these episodes that the last one, the latest one I could find was like three years ago, and like a hundred people watched it, and it's from three years ago, and right. it's like in a basement or something. I don't know. I, <laughs> well, it's it like really nineteen seventies looking. Very low the whole production thing. quality, right. and I know he did have a show for a while on public access TV. He apparently had a show before on Sci-Fi. Um, so I don't know how this con the content is being presented in the new show. Uh, from what I, the reviews I read, he apparently had Dr. Roger Lear uh -huh. on the show. Okay. Um, I but, think you know the way in which the the it seems that these topics are being presented. I don't know. To me, it seems to be a setback. It seems to be kind of presenting them uh, in a hokey fashion. That's yeah. what that's the, the that's what I get from it. I as well, and I guess we should really watch the show before we give our final judgment on it, but. I, yeah, that would be I fair. I don't but have high hopes. Yeah. Larry King's CNN show, Larry King Live, ended in mid-2010, but in July 2012, King launched a new talk show on the web titled Larry King Now. On his former show, King brought attention to the subject of UFOs on several occasions. And after just one month of being back on, on the air, so to speak, King is exploring the UFO topic once again. 
On August 20th, the episode of Larry King now focused entirely on UFOs. And King's guests were the UFO researcher and filmmaker James Fox, musician and UFO researcher Tom DeLong, and Michael Shermer, the executive director of the Skeptic Society and publisher of Skeptic Magazine. Early in the episode, King shows his guest one of the famous UFO photographs taken by Paul Trent in McMinnville, Oregon in 1950. Shermer quickly chimes in, looks like a hubcap to me. But Fox jumps in and explains, I actually have an interview with the witnesses on camera about this. Paul said it was a case where three photographs were taken, there were multiple eyewitnesses, obvious points of reference, broad daylight, crystal clear, totally in focus. Under scientific scrutiny, in the Condon Report, the scientific study it was done by prominent scientists, they concluded that this was a real object, roughly 20 to 30 feet in diameter, a silvery metallic object that flew within sight of two witnesses. That was subjected to rigorous scientific analysis. And King also brings up two recent instances where officials have made headlines by talking about the alleged Roswell, New Mexico UFO crash of 1947. He first mentions retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dick French, who recently spoke about UFOs in an exclusive interview with Open Minds. King also mentions former CIA officer Chase Brandon, who recently asserted that he stumbled on some evidence in a CIA possession that confirmed to him that there was a craft from beyond this world that crashed at Roswell. King gets Brandon on the phone, it's pretty interesting, and James Fox jumps at the chance to ask, uh, ask Brandon a question, and so he asks, did you have confirmation in that folder that Roswell was an extraterrestrial spacecraft? And Brandon answers, I saw what validated my long-held belief that Roswell was as it was reported, and I believe as many millions, if not hundreds of millions of people, that we are not alone in this vast cosmos. And there are many instances in this episode where the guests talk over each other and have difficulty voicing their thoughts and opinions about being around, interrupted. And sadly, this is a typical pretty much of any dialogue where both skeptics and proponents are present. Uh, Tom DeLong astutely points out that skeptic Michael Shermer seems angry. And DeLong comments, you're so biased on one side and that scares me too. DeLong has researched UFOs since the mid-90s. He appeared on the radio program Coast to Coast AM in December 2011, and he displayed an impressive level of UFO knowledge, and during his appearance on Larry King Now, he again showed just how well-read he is on this subject. And Larry King is clearly fascinated by UFOs, and by continuing to feature the topic on his show, he obviously feels that they merit a lot of serious, you know, study. And so that's, it's really great to see him back, because, I mean, we, we've seen so many of these UFO dialogues he's done before, and then you know, with the departure of his show, there went. Yeah, the, the, the shows he's done on this in the past have been really great. James Fox has been on a couple of them himself. But, uh, you know, he's had some great people on these discussions. You know, former Arizona Governor Fife Symington and some of the people that James Fox has worked with mm -hmm. um, through his research. So I thought overall this was a good show. It was very, it's very brief because it's a, a web, web right, series. Right, 20 minutes so, or so. Right, so they don't really get to get into a lot of stuff. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of talking over <laughs> each other it's, and failure it's to It's kind of hard to, yeah, to see. We just did it right now. <laughs> it's, yeah. So it's, it's, they have trouble asserting their points in a really quick fashion. And so I think that's why it's drawn out because there's so many different viewpoints here and, and I don't know, it's hard to be clear cut. Yeah, definitely, but it's definitely worth watching. And uh, I will point out, I mean, I, I'm a big Tom DeLonge fan and I don't think a lot of people realize and give him the credit that he deserves yet that uh, how much of a UFO researcher he is and the mm -hmm. knowledge he has on the subject. I think a lot of people assume that because he's this rock star that he's like, I don't know, like Sammy Hager, just <laughs> someone who like, can talk about, oh yeah, I, I had an abduction experience. But no, Tom is a serious researcher. He's read so many books and he can speak intelligently about this. And he brought up some really good, or tried to bring up some yeah. really good points during this interview on Larry well, King. Yeah, and he was quoting like Jacques Vallée and you know, Heineck and all these other people. So it's, it was really interesting. And for those who don't know, uh, Tom DeLonge is leads, or one of the lead singers of Blink-182. Um, and it's, it's cool to see him coming out. And he also, also just launched last year, I believe, a website called Strange Times that you should all check out. Our content's featured on there quite a bit as well. Yeah, strangetime.com. And we will uh, we'll have Tom on the show in the future because uh, we've got a lot of, lot of stuff to talk, to talk with Tom about. Mm -hmm. But he's, he, he's an interesting guy. I, I uh, admire a lot of what he does within the UFO field and, and away from it. But uh, we'll, we'll get Tom on the show for you.
Our audience submission today comes to us from Ron Lansing in Surprise, Arizona. On August 2nd, Ron was out testing the ability of his video camera to record aerial objects at night. He was following a high altitude plane with his camera when he saw another object flying very quickly through the sky. By referencing the very useful website Heavens Above, that's heavens-above.com if you're not familiar with the site, but Ron was able to identify the fast-moving object as the Chinese Tiangong-1 space station. When he analyzed his footage on the computer, he was able to zoom in enough to make out what he suspects is the docking area of the space station on the right side of the object. Very good work, Ron, and thank you so much for your submission. This is a great one, and I'm excited to see stuff like this because he was testing out this camera, shooting stuff at night using uh, you know, the night, night mode and infrared and checking out what... Uh, what his camera could do following airplanes and how well it, it came out. And he just happened to catch, he actually caught two objects zooming mm -hmm. by. I'm not sure what the other one was, but the second object, or I think it was the first object that he saw fly by, he determined was the space station, and that is so cool. Well, what I'm so impressed with, too, is we have, we rarely see this, where he actually made the conscious effort to go and try to figure out what it was before he assumed that it was something way out of the ordinary so that was great and something else he did that we don't see much of is he used a tripod so that helps <laughs> so he had, he had stable footage he had a yeah. good camera and he was able to then take it in the computer and zoom in enough it's still you know when you zoom in on something that that's far that far away you're not going to see it very well it's still kind of pixelated and but he was able to make out the shape enough and look at heavens above to find out that the coinciding time with that object most likely, most likely, not, not definitively, but yeah. most likely was the Chinese space station. Awesome. Thank you for your submission, Ron. In space news this week, the search for potentially habitable planets has largely focused on Earth-like rocky worlds, orbiting sun-like stars. But according to a new study, Earth-like planets around white dwarf stars may also provide habitable environments. According to New Scientist, new research by scientists at the Open University in the UK shows that an Earth-like planet in a white dwarf's habitable zone would get light at the right wavelengths to sustain photosynthesis. And crucially, such a world would not get too much damaging ultraviolet radiation, which can stop life in its tracks. New Scientist explains that the team reached their conclusion by simulating conditions created by a white dwarf star, by calculating the amount of light that would reach a planet's surface, and comparing that with light wavelengths absorbed by DNA. A hypothetical planet with an Earth-like atmosphere would have photosynthesis conditions almost identical to those on Earth. New Scientist also points out that previous studies have suggested that habitable zones may exist on planets orbiting white dwarf stars, so this study further supports the theory. This understanding of conditions and locations in which habitable environments may exist continues to evolve, and with this evolution comes the likelihood that potentially habitable worlds are common in the universe. So, just chalk up some more. Woo! Strange objects are always appearing in space photos, and there are always people who you know, quickly jump to conclusion that strange objects must belong to extraterrestrials. And not surprisingly, this has already started happening with new photos taken by the new Mars rover Curiosity. Lee Spiegel of the Huffington Post recently compiled several of these assertions in an article. NASA has offered explanations for many of these peculiarities seen in photos, but some remain a mystery. For example, while he was examining one of the Martian photos from Curiosity, Spiegel himself noticed a solid circular object just sitting there quite a distance away from the rover. He called JPL to get their opinion on the strange object, but as of the date we were recording this episode, Spiegel was still waiting for a response. It kind of looks like it's probably going to be a rock. It looks like a big boulder, yeah. yeah. And Lee himself even speculates he, that that's probably what it's it a is. Boulder, but too. He's smart. He you know, wants to ask, and I know there are plenty of people who don't uh, want to listen to what people at NASA have to offer. They, you know, for one reason or another, think that they might be hiding information from us. But mm -hmm. well, hey, both you and I know. I mean, we're not trying to, you know, debash anything on photos that come through because we would be so excited to find something on Mars. So right. uh, not trying to go that route, but so far everything I've seen in regards to people bringing up UFOs have been explainable with, you know, like when they mistook the... Um, the heat shield? Heat shield, yeah, dropping down and... 
Yep, I mean, there, there are a lot of explanations, and the explanations that have been offered by the experts, if you want to believe them, and I don't see any reason not to, but uh, they are plausible explanations. And, you know, with a lot of this stuff that we see in photos in space, let alone here on Earth, we see it all the time here on Earth, but with photography, there are so many things that can happen with the camera, camera glitches, mm -hmm. and then you add space to it, and you have atmospheric conditions and other things that can happen, and we've seen some of those explanations for, glit for items in photos now with, with dead pixels and Right, that's what I was just about to say. Mark D'Antonio, he speculated that that was indeed the one pixel right. error was going on there. So the, these identifications are, are good educated guesses in my opinion, but you know that's, you can make your own decision. And do go check out uh, Lee Spiegel's article on the Huffington Post. If you go to the Huffington Post, look in the weird news section, or just go to Huffington Post and search Lee Spiegel, and that's S-P-E-I-G-E-L. Hey, it's been a while since we talked about our old friend, the Kepler Space Telescope, but Kepler is back in the news this week. NASA's Planet Hunter discovered 41 more alien planets. Space.com explains that these new planets were announced in two separate scientific papers, bringing the number of verified Kepler worlds to 115 and total exoplanet tally to nearly 800. And there are still 2,321 planet candidates still to be verified. It's going to take a while to verify all those, but well, super and exciting. And Kepler's going to keep them rolling in. I mean, that thing is just awesome. And, you know, we used to hear about Kepler, oh, probably once a week, but... Uh, Ma Mars is taking Ma the Mar excitement Mars <laughs> took away. the spotlight, and that's all right. But uh, we still get excited about Kepler, so more planets. Now let's talk with our guest today, Ruben Uriarty. Well, Ruben, thanks so much for being on the show. We're excited to have you today. Thank you very much for, for having me on, on your program. You bet. Well, I know recently, and we talk about uh, the Curiosity mission in Mars a lot on the show, especially lately, and I know that you're a member of the Mars Society, and uh, the Mars Society recently, at their uh, recent conference, watched uh, a feed from JPL during the landing, and uh, before we get into that, I wonder if you could give us a brief overview uh, of what the Mars Society is. Well, they, uh, I just recently joined the organization. Um, they have a website. It's uh, www.marsociety.org. Or, the organization is basically focused on the man exploration of Mars, and they have a great network of people that are involved in, in promoting and networking and politicking uh, as far as with the, um, with the eventual goal of getting uh, man exploration but <clears throat> it's going through a, a series of steps um, Dr. Robert Zerbin is, our, is the president of the uh, of the organization he's a fantastic guy uh, uh, and they have some great leadership it's all voluntary uh, it's just like with, with my other organization called MUFON Joe UFO Network um, we're voluntary, but we follow the same um, motto, which is basically you work hard, there's no pay, and it's just internal glory. <laughs> That's the similarity. Well, well um, we're excited to talk about UFOs with you, and we'll do that in just a minute. But um, just to stay on Mars for a little bit, uh, I, got, I have to ask you. I mean, we're incredibly excited about this. I have to ask you, as, as somebody, especially you know, somebody who's a member of the, the Mars Society, what was it like? watching the landing take place i have to tell you it was like being in the olympics you know it was it was awesome um throughout the day or throughout the whole weekend we had a number of officials from jpl that were coming giving us updates we had a number of nasa uh, officials as well and a number of the invitees there were a lot of nervous uh faces obviously because this was a 2.5 billion dollar project and uh, if, 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 I, if I, um, I have a visitor no. my cat just joined me I'm sorry <laughs> okay spooky just give me give me a break here sorry about that <laughs> give him a oh, microphone that's all right We're, uh, oh, oh, I mean, he, 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 he's definitely um, uh, one of my my buddies here anyway um, the fact that being in that room um, throughout the day, you saw you saw the, all these nervous uh, faces, and basically, what was going to happen was something very historical. Whether it was going to be a failure or or a successful 
landing. And as it turned out, it, it, it turned out to be an awesome landing. It, it was like being there, and as I mentioned, once that rover landed, it was an oversense of jubilation. And people were just shouting, clapping. Uh, people were, it were everyone. A lot of people were yelling "USA, USA, <laughs> USA!" You know, and that's why I thought it was in the Olympics there. And people were uh, were hugging each other because uh, we were getting the actual live feed from the JPL. And these, it was amazing because these guys were clapping and already hugging. And I said, oh, my God, we're, we're going to make it. And sure enough, it was just an incredible technological feat. Out, right after the applause and everything, and then some guy brought a bottle of champagne, and I made sure I got, I got my cup full. <laughs> and then uh, I, I went around, and then I went right up to, to Dr. Doc, Doc Zurbin and a number of the other officials. And I said, hey, let's have a toast. And they looked at me, and I said, yeah, let's do it. Let's, and they said, let's do it. So we just started toasting and start saying, on to Mars, on to Mars and beyond. <laughs> it was it was incredible. I was so jazzed. I was just happy to be there at that moment. Um, they were they were referring it to as the seven minutes of terror because right. the sequence that it took to, to have this uh, laboratory, this robot, from descending out of a craft, then detaching from the craft to a parachute, and then from a parachute to a retro rockets and then what was so cool was that these retro rockets was, was lowering the rover on, on the tethered cables and then releasing the gently i said all it took was just one small step we would have had a total failure but the fact that these engineers have been working on this project for over 10 years and to see their 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 happiness their jubilation they were just they were so charged that i was so i was so thrilled to be there are you going to be on board for the uh, one-way ticket to Mars here coming up? <laughs> <laughs> I know there's been talk about that. I mean, uh, you know, I, I grew up with the space program. That's why I have such an interest. You know, I've always been interested in aviation, and I, I followed the space program up to where we're at now. And just seeing there's so many changes, uh, I believe we will have – it will happen. I'm not sure if it will happen in my lifetime, probably in yours for sure. Uh, so, but I plan to be around 100 years. So. But the fact that uh, the, the, the emphasis on it, the commercialization of space, there's a number of uh, firms, uh, private enterprises, that are now focusing on trying to get a manned mission to Mars or uh, perhaps to the moon or other, other um you know, the, perhaps some moons on Mars, for example, uh, the fact that we're almost there. Uh, and they're going to figure out a way, and they, they're going to figure out a way to do it uh, a lot more cheaper but better mm -hmm. compared to, to the enormous cost that Na NASA was involved in. And somebody who's really pushing for that is Elon Musk of SpaceX, right? And uh, Oh, yeah. What an incredible guy. You know, he was sharing his story. Uh, um, here's a man, I believe he was co-partner on PAL the internet mm -hmm. pay system and how he had uh, basically was interested in space. Um, I, I, I was really chuckling. He actually went to the Soviet Union to buy several ICBMs and uh, they, 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 were, they were shocked <laughs> that there would be a young man uh, going around actually inquiring about buying their missiles. But in a long, in a, in a long term, um, they have developed the SpaceX, uh, the Falcon 9, Dragon, and there was uh, the actual capsule of that was on display outside of the of the uh, convention center, and in a couple of years they're going to be they're going to be transporting our astronauts back up into the um, space lab compared to uh, hiring the Russians, which they've been doing, uh, they, but it'll be a, at a lot less cheaper. It'll be far less expensive than what uh, currently what we're what uh, we're being charged by the Soviet Union. Or by, the, by Russia. There's definitely a lot of exciting things happening in that field, but to sort of switch directions here, you're actually the state director of Northern California's MUFON Mutual UFO Network, as well as the international director of investigations, I believe. Um, so you guys get tons of reports of different current UFO cases. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about some maybe exciting cases you guys are dealing with right now. Well, um, What's occurring right now, and we just passed the month of July, um, 
it turned out to be a very, very large, uh, statistically, we had more reports uh, coming in, uh, close to 1,000 approximately. Um, the majority of those are in the United States. The, we, I live in California. We tend to, get, tend to be number one or number two in terms of, of the uh, reports submitted. And pro probably a lot of that has to do not just because maybe because they like us here, they want to be Californians, but the fact that uh, <laughs> the fact that uh, we hey, we're a large state with a large population, but it will vary. Um, there, so we get our, our number of reports. I think the statistically, what's been the most highest has been people seeing a number of orbs, uh, orb-shaped objects, and I'm I'm involved in an investigation uh, on that ironically. Uh, on July the 21st, uh, we had a uh, picnic for Northern California. We had a, a star watch uh, potluck gathering, and we're trying to do that on an annual basis, get as many people to attend. And we had it at uh, at the I'm trying to remember it. It was at the museum. Uh, it was a railroad museum. <laughs> Sorry for the time. I can't forget the time. Uh, the title is me, but it was a nice site, and the the problem was is that we uh, we started our night watch a little bit too late. Uh, we had our backs away from the main skies, and where we had we had some speakers and that. Well, what happened was uh, we had we were later than the, the that night. I got a phone call, and then later the next day, I was receiving reports of these orb like like objects. Uh, they were caught on film. We have pictures. They're flying in formation, and there were three waves. Uh, they had three three objects flying, shifting, and then they start flying upward. And so there was a sequence. A couple of minutes later, another wave of three objects flying in formation, and the the uh, one, some of the key witnesses uh, that saw this and reported it um, were were people. Uh, for example, one gentleman was uh, was in the military. He's flown in many types of planes, and we're not that far from Travis Air Force Base. And he said he knows his airplanes, and this is something totally totally out of his experience. So that that's something that was quite unique. Um, so I'm still there were about four or five major cases that were submitted that I'm working on right now. Um, but I'm, I, I was just totally uh, imp amazed by that. And what's kind of interesting, too, was back in 1993, in that general vicinity, we had three major crop circles in, in that area, in, one in Vacaville. We had a 900-foot formation in the middle of a cornfield close to an airport. Uh, we had one, what was known in another area called Rockville, that attracted thousands of people. Uh, it, I, I, I stand, I, you know, I, I had, a, I've been in many crop circles in England, but when I first saw this, when I said, oh God, who, I said, the guys from England must be here because <laughs> it was totally amazing. And the fact that the farmer was so cooperative and allowed uh, uh, us to come in and do the research. But the problem is that it attracted so many tourists, so many people, um, it was, we had to do it quickly. But what a lot of people do not know was there was another formation across the across in another field, and we kept that under wraps away from the public so we can do our research. But it was just amazing that we had the formations and then this, these uh, sightings um, uh, several years later, of course, but right there when, where we had our picnic. So I, I'm I'm hoping that we'll have our picnic there next year again. In what part of California is that? Uh, and up close by Vacaville, going towards Sacramento off of Highway okay. 12. It, it could give you a sense of that vicinity there. Awesome. That's really cool. I mean, that's sort of a hotbed of activity up there right now. And Oh, uh, uh, yes. yes. Um, perfect, I'm, perfect timing for you guys to be out there and actually have this <laughs> sighting happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was really cool. Do you guys have, uh, how are you doing with your, your I guess, supply of investigators? Do you have enough people to investigate the, the quantity of sightings you're getting? No, actually, we're always trying to recruit. Um, again, like, like I said, this is voluntary. A lot of people, you know, have other responsibilities, full-time full -time jobs, families, and that. So we try to fit them in. Um, my assistant state director and my chief investigator 
um, Devlin Rungi, she's been working very hard. I'm really, I'm very lucky to have her on, on, on our staff. Um, she's been really, I mean, if you want, I would highly recommend that you have her on the show someday. Um, because she's been around and I'm so blessed to have people like her on my team. Yeah, um, just for, I guess, our viewers notice, when you're trying to recruit these volunteers to be investigators, what sort of this process that they need to go through to uh, start, you know, becoming certified MUFON investigators? Uh, I have uh, people that are interested, they can go onto our main, um, main website, which is MUFON.com. Uh, in there, it'll say how to become an investigator. The process basically involves in you having the, the desire and hopefully have the time and resources. Uh, you could purchase the manual, uh, which is a must. Uh, you take the exam. It's an open book exam. The exam is basically, it, it's in the manual itself. Take your time. It's open book. Um, mo most of the questions are referenced in the manual, and there's other, other questions that you may have to do some more research. You need to later submit your, your tests, and it's uh, reviewed in, by our main MUFON headquarters. Uh, they will review and see whether you pass. You need at least an 80% score. And then uh, from there, uh, they'll get in touch with the state director, who then will also coordinate with their chief investigator. Then we'll get you logged on into our CMS system, our case management system. And then get you out and do some training. Uh, we, we, many of the states have some very good training programs. Uh, we'll try to get you or get that person connected with a seasoned uh, investigator and learn the ropes. And I have to tell you, Marie uh, and, and Jason, I've been, um, I'm still learning. You know, I, I, every time you, there's a case out there, uh, um, there's something always quite new. and. Um, and you just make it humble uh, how much uh, how much that you don't know and so it's it's some quite quite amazing and, and the thing that I find again on the international scene what's occurring in, like I always said what it, what is occurring in my backyard is it's occurring throughout the world right and for people in in your area is there a website that uh, people can go to to find out what uh, Northern California MUFON is doing Yes, uh, thanks to Devlin, we now have a web website, which is, you have to spell it out, northerncaliforniamufon.com, and it'll give you all the updates and everything else, and so we just start, have, we just, uh, we've had it now for a couple of months, and we're getting a lot of hits. Uh, in, interestingly, we've been getting a lot of hits internationally, so I guess our, <laughs> that's also been, been very interesting. Wow. So in, you actually recently came out with a book with Noe Torres in December, I believe, called uh, The Cisco Grove UFO Encounter. Um, and now you're going to be also appearing at our conference in February at the International UFO Congress, which we're really excited to have you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, little bit about what you're going to talk about? Yes, um, hopefully I uh, would like to focus on the uh, Aliens in the Forest as the title of our book. It's a it's a case that happened back in 1964. It was referred to as the Cisco Grove case. The investigator who is now deceased, um, his name was Mr. Paul Cerny, was involved in investigating that case. Through a lot of synchronicity, Marine uh, and Jason, I was able to uh, reconnect. I was able to get the files. Uh, I was able to meet the, the witnesses. And I was just totally stunned how a gentleman never changed his, his story, and so I basically used Paul Cerny's uh, notes, and it, we were able to get his entire testimony. And it's quite an incredible story, uh, having a, a deer hunter and when his friends are going up there in the Tahoe Na Na National Forest, and then um, he gets lost, and he has to climb up to on a tree to avoid uh, bears and mountain lions, and then. Um, he has an encounter with the spaceship, and then later uh, he has to deal with these beings that are trying to capture him throughout the entire night. Oh. And yeah, it, it's uh, and, and he made it. I mean, that's the, that's what's extraordinary is the fact that he was um, a person that had an actual encounter. He was not abducted, but it was he had his own war of the worlds. Oh, it's incredible.
It's an interesting case, and I can't wait to hear you talk about it. So that'll be a lot of fun seeing you at the Congress. We're really excited to have you in February. Thank you, Jason. I'm look, looking really forward to seeing you both and the rest of the, rest of the gang there. And um, uh, this would be my first time. I've always wanted to come to the Congress, so I'm so thrilled that I was been, been invited as a speaker and looking forward to networking and meeting a lot, a lot of friends and meeting new people. Well, we're excited for it, and uh, you know we always love talking about UFOs with you, Ruben, and love to hear about the latest things you're working on. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Maureen. Yep. All right. Take Bye -bye. care, Ruben. That is all for this episode of Spacing Out. Be sure to visit openminds.tv for all the latest news. And thanks to all of you who like our episodes on YouTube and leave us comments. We really appreciate that and encourage you to feel free to interact with us. Thanks for joining us this week. And remember, if you'd like to submit a photo, video, or anything else to the show, you can always email us at contact at openminds.tv. And we'll consider your submission for inclusion on a future episode. Be sure to join us next week when we'll talk with Micah Hanks from the Graylian Report. I'm Maureen Ellsbury. And I'm Jason McClellan. We will see you in the future.